This is not an ad. Don't click away. Hey, everybody, it's me, Mike. Don't click off. Listen, do you like things like Critical Role? Do you want a new podcast form of a story-focused tabletop RPG? How about one of Vampire the Masquerade? Well, let me tell you about Stitch of Fate, the one that I am the storyteller for with four other voice actors, including Mark Mir. That's right, the voice of Commander Shepard. Season one wrapped up a couple weeks ago. It's 15 episodes, each an hour long, and we're prepping for the rev up towards season two, launching in February. The format is an audio podcast, each episode about an hour, and we have ourselves a professional audio editor to make it sound like an audiobook. So theme music for each characters, sound effects for the actions taking place, and editing out of all those awkward silences and rules look up. It's really an incredibly fun experience. So hey, all I ask is you go check it out if it sounds interesting to you. It's called Stitch of Fate. You can find it on pretty much every one of your podcasting platforms. That's Stitch of Fate, a Vampire the Masquerade 5th Edition podcast. Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Chiluminati Podcast, episode 83. As always, I'm one of your hosts, Mike Martin, joined by my two co-hosts, Alex Fasciani, who's doing, hey. you can't see it, but he's like he Superman, Superman flying. Yeah, yeah he's launch. Superman flying. You gotta launch and Jesse the podcast. Cox. I will not oh, okay. Superman fly. I'm, I'm fine on the ground. I'm good. Yeah, I'm fine on the ground, too. I'm afraid of heights. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. But that hasn't uh, stopped the heights of our Patreon from climbing oh, ever God. higher. Oh, the wow, value, quick, the benefits, the, the the good you're adding to the world. It's unbelievable. You're going to go to this website and you are going to become the next president of the United States on January 21st. Yourself. What? That's, <laughs> and that's not a conspiracy. That's the truth. So head on what? down to patreon.com slash Chiluminati pod and you too can become the president of the United States. You are right making this promises episode. you cannot keep right after this episode for 15 minutes. You will be in my as far as I'm concerned, you will be the president. <laughs> You'll get of at the least United one States. vote. <laughs> you will get one letter from Alex signed. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm still find, too ambitious. I will find a different dead identity for each person <laughs> in that tier. And I will vote as for each one of as you I, know, I, I don't want to have to report you, but I yeah, will. Again, I will you don't report, have to report me. You don't have to. I, I want to do live I shows will. when the pandemic's over. And I, I mean, I don't want to replace you with some stranger. <laughs> you want to just like find some YouTube video of me like Alex, Alex Fasciani at Hard Rock Cafe, Lubbock, Texas. I, I will be the, I'm going to take down the government. <laughs> Dude, did you know hey, uh, like Michael did, Richards did you know there's a town in Texas simply called cut and shoot Texas I love that fantastic there's like a thousand people that live that's there why do you, my, why do you that's know my this? two favorite things to do because it, uh, it's an area in which I visit it, it's near an area I visit often those are the two American pastimes cutting, cutting and, shooting? and shooting it's true Hell yeah. not necessarily in that order I think reverse cutting the order up you know more. like you cut a b- like beef up, you know, you is cut that, up. Was, yeah, is that cut up yeah. your enemies? You can yeah. cut up, there's a lot of cutting and then shooting yeah. movies. See, this guns. seems like a, this seems the like breeze? drugs to me. Yeah, this both seems like drugs. Shooting both the breeze, seems like drugs. LSD. Hell is that yeah. how we bring it back? If Hell you're yeah, bring shooting that, LSD, that's, that's a problem. In 2021, <laughs> in 2021, the cigarettes of America is going to be LSD. We deserve it, honestly. We just need to. We just need to escape into a different realm. I'm putting it out there. What if there was a day, just putting it out there, where the government said, F it. We're making everything legal for today. The purge? Like the purge, but not like murder. But like, you know what? Get a little wild. Oh, like you can just like if you have some heroin in your house and you've been dying to get wacky. Yeah, but you like, you know, but not like in your home. You want to take it out to a restaurant and Six Flags Magic Mountain. Yeah, yeah. On, yeah, you want to go, you know, you not wanna, scary like, farm. You're like walking on your way to yeah. freaking Splash Mountain, dropping acid, mushroom just, laser tag. Right. I'm just saying. Mush- oh my god, you've never mushroom done laser Disney tag. unless you've done Disney High. I'm just letting you know. Yeah. The Millennium Falcon <laughs> ride hits different when you're chilling with the Bean Boy. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, dude. <laughs> Disneyland is an amazing place because they added alcohol to it. 
When I drunk drove the Millennium Falcon at midnight, <laughs> that was I miss pre COVID, man. That's One the type we'll of stuff you used again, to be able gentlemen. to do. You used to stumble One onto day. the bridge of the Millennium Falcon and drunk drive it with somebody else's mom. It's fucking wild. <laughs> Shit. My God, Alex. What a life you lived pre COVID. I want to go back there. <laughs> It'll never be the same. Alex. I remember I, I remember squirting that lime juice into my eye like it was yesterday. <laughs> Uh, well, boys, we've got to wrap it back to the more fun to- topic of conversation today, because today I just wanted hardcore. to give everybody a pick me up before we have to go straight yeah, to I understand, bro, fucking I understand. Squidwardville. I just because we're going Debbie, yeah. down, De- Debbie downtown. There are a lot of specifics there, like a lot of not just real specific moments you picked out. What do you mean? <laughs> the lime juice in your eye, particular. Those real specific moments you chose. It really to, happened. It's real. It did I did. No, I believe you. But it did just happen. There's emotional context to it that we don't get to have that you do. <laughs> did I already tell the story where I slipped and fell in my own piss during a live show <laughs> while I while I was supposed to be performing on we stage? We were there. We and saw that shit on my knees. Was that? Yeah, was that, I was going to say. Was that in Boston? Good times. Don't worry. I think we every man. I'm going to put this out there. Almost every man. I can't say every. Almost every man has had to go into a bathroom where the floor was covered in something. Just, it's like Jumanji happened in the bathroom. Like you just it like, oh, you're so like looking gross. for like a big snake to be somewhere. Like, I don't I know. know. We're going to listen. This is I'm going to make this story short. But uh, this is like Boy Scout era, 12 year old Mathis. Uh, oh uh, Camp Yahweh. I'm going to picture uh, so the kid from up. Is that OK? Yeah, that's totally yeah, fine. Okay, camp right. Yahweh. So all Boy Scouts from around the world go Boy to one Scouts camp for like a week. Boy Scouts going to Camp Yahweh? Seems, yeah. That seems like really right. like Chiluminati adjacent. Yeah, yeah, right? right? No, no, yeah, yeah, no. No, it went, I can't remember. It was like, a, it was, I can't remember the exact name of it. It was like Yagu or something weird. Camp Yahweh but, uh, is just camp Wagu? It's God Camp, right? <laughs> Look it up. Seriously, Boy Scout Camp begins with a Y. It's weird. But point is, I too <laughs> like went to the bathroom. I ran into a stall. I opened the door and I stepped in something and slipped and fell into it. Only to realize it was human fecal matter. Hey, and I was way, just. Way, oh, way, oh. <laughs> no, all right. I think I have you all topped really quickly in Poland at a Polish train station. Oh, went, no. went to the bay. It was like midnight. Went to the bathroom. Had to go, had to go number two floor covered in liquid. Don't know oh, what no. it was. Went to the bathroom and was just like, like squatting over the toilet because it was not, it was not okay. And then <laughs> looked around, no toilet paper. So I had to hobble my ass to another oh, stall. No. <laughs> no. It was, I never felt, I like spent the rest of the vacation kind of unclean. Like I just yeah. felt like, I'll no never shower is going to fix that. Mm-mm. It you was no one this, shower. You can we'll cut this you. out of the podcast if you want, Mathis, but. Nothing. If you want to go on a journey like one of these journeys, uh, you go on YouTube, Google double tapered shit. And there's a clip of a dude who is a base coach for the Royals or something like that. And he is standing there and he is like his mic is on, but he it doesn't seem like he knows it's on. And he's like telling this story about this time that he like shit his pants down his leg when he was in Vegas and it's like unbelievable. <laughs> oh my um, god! Anyway, uh, yeah, anyway human, okay, rights, human rights violations. Let's get in it. Anyway, so last, <laughs> the last, last week. So this episode will either be depending on how long it's been when I get to a certain point in the script. Will either be the final episode or next week will absolutely you, be the final. Episode. How is that where we're at? Where you're like depending on where we get to? No, no. It's just depending how long. Like. Because it depends on how much how much time gets dedicated to you guys going. Are you fucking kidding me? It just depends on how just sad depends. we get. Just say it. Yeah, it just depends it really on how is. sad we are. It really depends are. on how we have, how long we wallow in certain aspects of the revelations that are due for today. Because while last week was the revelations of like the deep the depths they would go, and then the eventual death of one of their own, and the subsequent cover up the government had, and you would think that that would eventually put reins on the MK Ultra uh, program. What today is about is to see the absolute explosion that MK Ultra had following this death and cover up the tentacles in which they crawled into every aspect of government and so many different conspiracies and uh, actual like assassination attempts, which is where we're going to open up with today. 
And MK Ultra Wait, truly grew. We're starting at assassinations. We're starting at assassinations. Cool. All right, just so everyone uh, has the bar. All right. Isn't that so, basically um, where we ended anyway last time? Yeah, that's kind of where we were kind of yeah. transitioning into. But today, you can watch that there was no true punishment right away for MK Ultra. It just grew like a cancer and did not stop. Now, what the last thing we covered uh, as a brief kind of refresher is at the end. Uh, Gottlieb's little memo that let everybody know the materials and methods he was researching or wished to research as MK Ultra was growing, which were, but I'm not going to list all of them, just to name a few though, materials which will promote intoxicating effects of alcohol, but not actually an alcohol, substances which will enhance the ability of individuals to withstand privation, torture, and coercion during interrogation and what? so-called T- brainwashing. Can I ask a timeout? Can I ask a question? This, yeah. God, I'm already ruining this. Um, That's fine. <laughs> alcohol that produces intoxication but is not alcohol right isn't that just alcohol <laughs> why doesn't it need to be alcohol <laughs> yeah, why can't they just well, use the alcohol? things they could, they could quickly like prick somebody with and then give them like oh, intoxicating like, bam, like they're make, drunk yeah and they don't bam, know you're drunk they need to be taken and they away don't know or, yeah that, that kind drunk. of thing like, it's just yeah. when you said liquids that aren't alcohol but like make you drunk i was like why not just use alcohol these, I just can't. No, 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 I didn't say liquids. Materials I which just, will prevent or capture out or create or promote. I yes. just can't get over the list. It's like <laughs> it's, things it's that huge. they're going to. We're only going to cover like yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the nuts. laser beam uh, from uh, go, uh, Goldfinger. Uh, the uh, <laughs> scorpion thing, the spear that he shoots out from Mortal Kombat. <laughs> I'd like, uh, yeah. Kylo Ren's lightsaber. Um, Damien's powers <laughs> from the omen when he kills that lady. Uh, no, the no. thing. I want to make the, <laughs> the thing. thing. Um, Godzilla substances which, nuclear breath. <laughs> yeah, we could just get that. Yeah, that way. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's as absurd as you're being. Like, if there was even a sliver of a potential that th- those things could be made real under this program, they'd be trying to do it. Um, and the, and one of my favorite ones, substances which alter personality structure in such a way that the tendency of the recipient to become dependent upon another person is enhanced. You know, like that a kind cult of shit. leader formula. Yeah, like cult leader formula. Yeah, that is an excellent way to put it. That is Make like them Cthulhu. Depend- That's like dependent. Cthulhu shit, like for real. Yeah. And that was the beginning of 1955, and that's where we pick up. See, in the beginning, in 1955, Gottlieb was actually further than drafted because a few assassination plots were happening or were already attempted, one of which was actually one to kill Prime Minister Zhao and Lai of China. They attempted to assassinate him uh, by actually bombing a plane that was to take Zhao to the Asian African Congress at Bandung, Indonesia. It actually exploded in midair. They, they did get the explosion off America C- American CIA people. But it was determined to have been caused a t- uh, by a time bomb triggered by an American-made MK7 detonator. But Zhao had actually changed plans one of the last minutes, was on an entirely another flight, and avoided the assassination attempt in 1955. But they just killed least. other random people? Oh, yeah. Whoever was on that plane died. Oh Everybody on the plane died. Dude. <laughs> How many dark sides do we fucking have? <laughs> dude, just, People of the world, please remember that Fred Rogers is also an American. Please. <laughs> Don't forget about in, Bruce Springsteen. For every Fred Rogers, there's like 30 of these assholes. We also have the guy from Smash Mouth. Please. That's true. <laughs> guy Fieri is an American. Yes. <laughs> guy Fieri is an American. Here's, here's a Chiluminati topic. Is it a coincidence that I said the guy from Smash Mouth and then Jesse said Guy it's, Fieri? Because I don't think I've ever seen him. the same. They I mean, look very similar. They seem like they're the same dude. Well, the CIA was frustrated, but not deterred. They wanted to kill Zhao. So they figured the next best plan was to try and poison him. And therefore, that's when they reached out to Gottlieb of MK Ultra and enlisted him, now officially entangling both the CIA and MK Ultra. The chemist concocted a poison to be placed in a rice bowl that Zhao would eat from. But shortly after before the attempt was to be made, news of it reached Deputy Director of the CIA General Lucian Truscott Jr. And Truscott felt that the agency's role in assassinating Zhao would become clear and cause great trouble for the United States. And so... The attempt was pulled last minute. When was and this? Then they when invented was the this sniper rifle that shot snakes. <laughs> Pew! And their snakes were to- they had their fangs gave off hypno poison. Yeah, it was air hypnosis' next greatest weapon. I'm not like we're not like the, you're you're we're laughing like that's like not what's happening here, but that's like just exactly what's happening here. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's funny enough. <laughs> But also in 1955, a new player came into the fold for MKUltra, a man by the name of George Hunter White. 
and he was moved from New York to San Francisco. And rather than see this as a deficit to MKUltra, where he was initially working and then moving him to San Francisco, as as White ran the safe house out that way, Gottlieb took the opportunity to instead use him to expand MKUltra into San Francisco. This operation had a similar goal to MKUltra Prime, but with an added twist. So this is like a sub-branch of MKUltra. It doesn't actually go by MKUltra, but it is being controlled by MKUltra. Um, they wanted to feed... So this, this, new, this new place being run by White uh, is where the place they wanted to feed drugs to unsuspecting civilians and observe their reactions, but add sex as a spicy twist to the whole thing. Go Who's on. having sex? What are you talking about? Yeah, the well, civilians. No. White gathered what? a group of prostitutes whose job was to bring clients to this place that he would from here on now only refer to as the pad and dose them with LSD while White watched and recorded their reactions. <laughs> this particular new <laughs> operation what was the dubbed. Fuck, man. What do you what would you what would you dub this operation? If this was your operation, what would you name it? Operation honeypot. Fuck Smell. Okay, Honeypot and Operation Fuck Smell. This was dubbed Operation Midnight Climax. Nice. Are you fucking it, kidding me? Nice. No, I'm not kidding you. That is the name it's of the operation. Good. That's that a good name. America World Police. Like what the <laughs> fuck is happening? And so, to help with the recruitment of prostitutes, White contracted a man by the name of Ira Ike Feldman, who had retired to California at the time. His first undercover job was to go undercover for the Narcotics Bureau. He worked a sting where he posed as a pimp, where he reports that he had a half a dozen girls working for him at the time, and another where he used a drug-addicted prostitute to entrap her Johns and paid her in heroin. What? So All he right. was he was what? undercover. He was he just was, moonlighting was, as a pimp. He was undercover. No, it was undercover work. He was fucking moonlighting. <laughs> it was it was under, it was legal because it was undercover work. Did he also, fund can we cancer just, research with his fucking profits? <laughs> can we just take a moment to talk about how every time someone from I don't know today, but even in the last ten years is like. I miss what America was a better nation. The yeah. 1950s is when we really like we're talking about the 50s right now. Like, yes, this guy had all these whores and he was, <laughs> he was using them and the paying them in drugs yeah. to entrap the Johns. And you're like, what the shit? We tried to kill this guy <laughs> by blowing up his plane, but then uh, he wasn't on the plane, but we still blew up the plane and everybody on the plane died. <laughs> I have a God feeling uh, <laughs> they may be wrong in their assumptions about the 50s. So... Uh, <laughs> Oh my uh, God! Ike was excelling at this undercover pimp job at this particular time, and so White decided undercover to undercover Feld- pimp job, dude. What the? I fuck? can't. I can't believe that they were like, "All right, get me the former undercover pimp." No, and no, then- he's he's actively an undercover pimp at this time. Still, I said former because I was referring to it in terms of modern day. All right, and all right, I'm not all sure right. so so this dude is an undercover pimp. He has multiple women working for him. I can't figure out. How they structured this is he was like, I'm taking your territory. Slap. Like, I can't. How he came in there and did this, I have no idea how this has happened. But then the fact that he then know. reports back. Like, I'm my not- question is. My question is, he's like, they're like, we need to have like a sex experiment. And he's like, well, um, funnily enough, sir, uh, I happen to be running this sick ass operation on the side uh, where I got about eight or nine bitches underneath me, baby. <laughs> They call okay, me. So they, I, need to put, I meant to put this up. They call me the they call me Choco Starlight. Intergalactic. We are going. We are going to lightning blitz through a few topics that should be that should be and will of and some of them will be full on episodes in this series in this show. But we will have to go through some like a like Whitey Bulger is going to be brought up in this episode. Whitey Bulger is in this. We can't talk. We can't talk much. About, it's a whole. What do you episode. mean, Whitey Bulger? You can't. Just yes. be like Whitey Bulger's in this, and be like, Let's no, move you'll on. see, you'll see when we get there. You'll see when we get what? there. He's in this episode. He's in this episode. <laughs> but we're only gonna be able to barely cover how he's involved because we're gonna one, one day we will talk about Whitey Bulger. We will. But right now, can we watch? Can we do a team watch of uh, that Johnny Depp movie? Sure, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, anyway, so White got word that Ike was excelling as an undercover pimp, and that's why he not decided. <laughs> No, not not Whitey. The other White. This is yeah. the White that's running the new, Operation the Midnight new kid Climax. In town. Yeah. So he decided let's bring let's bring Feldman in. Let's bring Ike in even further to MK Ultra. 
So he decided Ike's assignment was to recruit prostitutes who were unwitting MK Ultra contractors. Here was the terms of their contract. Unwitting contractors? Each prostitute was paid between $50 and $100 each time they brought a client back to the pad. They were also, on top of it, given a, quote, get out of jail free pass, unquote. Literally, they were given a card uh, when they were recruited for this that gave them White's phone number to call if they were ever busted by the police. They were then to give the card to the police officer who would then go to call White and the prostitute would then be set free. This is the plot of like a 60s Batman episode. Close, 1955. Mayor, they're having these ladies of the night are trapping these men. <laughs> Batman? This is a Batman? <laughs> I'll stop you now, Joker. It's Adam West, dude. He sounds like, he doesn't sound like Batman. He sounds like he's lost. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Holy bachelor pad, Batman. There's a bunch of whores here. Midnight Climax, Batman. <laughs> <laughs> Holy Midnight Climax, Batman. <laughs> Could air hypnosis be a Batman villain? Funny you should say that, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> One yeah, damn ca- Batman. <laughs> My penguin horse will deal with you. Yeah. <laughs> um, One MK Ultra officer later on went to say, quote, if we were scared enough of a drug not to try it ourselves, we sent it to white in San Francisco. End quote. And he would just feed the it to the horse. Because... The, the reason was White was notorious within the agency to not be as scared to test anything on anyone. You see, the operations in New York were still in some weird, twisted way in their own mind operating by a set of guidelines. There were certain drugs they wouldn't use. Like Fight However, Club? Like what guidelines? <laughs> but like if certain drugs were, were had too, potent, too high of a potential to kill or maybe hurt like no, they were already killing people. I'm aware. Listen, this is why I said it's twisted in their mind. But but white in their mind in San Francisco was the the play zone. Anything they weren't comfortable testing went to Sacramento or San Francisco with white. And uh, that's where he that's where they sent him. White Feldman and other agents observed that a man will often speak with within these drug tests. They observed that a man will often speak to the woman next to him after sleeping uh, after sleeping with her. So they began assigning their prostitutes specifically to stay with the clients for several hours later after the the deed had been done. Quote, to find a prostitute who is willing to stay is a hell of a shock to anyone used to prostitutes. It has a tremendous effect on the guy. It's a boost to his ego if she's telling him he was really neat and she and she sit and she wants to stay for a few extra hours. Time out. Time out. 1950s prostitution is yep. hilarious. Like, golly gee, mister. That was certainly a neat time I had with you. Nope. <laughs> wow. Uh-huh. Jinkies. You sure you really it? how it how it went. You mean it? I uh, make you feel special. <laughs> <laughs> gee, Alice. Nobody's ever said anything like that to me. I mean, no, you, gotta, you have to keep in mind they're also on LSD. Also, you're a praying mantis, Alice. What's the deal with that? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Like, they're also on LSD as this is happening. Um, continuing the quote, most of the time he gets pretty vulnerable. What the hell is he going to talk about? Not the sex. So he starts talking about his business. It's at this time she can lead him gently. Not so basically, the sex. in 1955, they discovered pillow talk is what it seems like. And LSD, I guess, would just make it a little easier. But yeah, they're trying to see if they can get these men, these civilians, to start divulging personal information. How deep and how much personal information can they pull What do they deem they personal information about these men? Do they know about them? Like, uh, they're talking about like business details. What are they willing to divulge about right, their, their but job? How much, and the, how much of it is true? Like, there's, that's a good question. I mean, if it, was, if it was somebody that you knew, like if it was yeah, like so somebody you knew, yes, if it was but, like a target, you could be like. You could report back what he says and you would be well, you able had a to baseline. Right. Yeah. yeah. So here's the thing. We don't know if they ever went to go because, again, we don't have the documents to follow up on some of this stuff. But at the same time, <clears throat> yeah, they could be fucking lying. Has MK Ultra at any point since its ince- inception been remotely scientific in any way? I like to think that at least some of the people had scruples, but I'm going to say in general, it's a big N.O. <laughs> exactly. So. I don't know. I wouldn't put it on them to actually do their research afterward. <clears throat> Regardless of how it went down, Gottlieb was actually pleased with the results and he ordered it even further expanded. White opened another safe house in Mill Valley. 
this safe house had the privacy necessary to test things that went beyond sex and drugs. Things brought to test here included stink bombs, itching powder, sneezing powder, and diarrhea, diarrhea, diarrhea inducers. Dr- oh, go what? ahead. Sorry. No, yeah. I just, so the prostitutes would bring them back and then like, and now for two yep. hours of ass blasting. Yep. <laughs> they, would, they would just test other more painful things on civilians brought here. It's just literally people that were like, perhaps we should try this. Yeah. Correct. Like, <laughs> like it's just, you it's just it. pure nonsense. Yeah. They also t- tested this stuff there. Drug lace swizzle sticks ultra thin hypodermic needles that could be used to poison a wine bottle through the cork and glass capsules that would release noxious gases when they now were crushed that is underfoot. Some J- those are three James, James Bond, Bond things. You yeah. weren't saying it you really weren't thinking James is. Bond when we were talking about the giant eight ball chamber. Oh, I definitely was for <laughs> that, that episode. No, no, I mean, like scientists, the, Nazi organizations that teamed up behind the, the scenes. Top, like Pierce Brosnan, James Bond things. What's like, I was also the Asian man and now I'm the, the son of the other guy. Like what? <laughs> Like, you know, yeah. the one where the guy, like, changes his entire body? Yeah. Um, no, that's that crazy. I'm talking about the crazy where it's like, the scene where it's like, dun, 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 dun. and then it's like a dude. <laughs> Every scene thing, in and James like, Bond? <laughs> yeah, but you know, like, the not evil villain part, but, like, the evil villain's underling who, like, when instead of dying, he's like, and now I shall eat this capsule, Mr. Bond, right? right. That's yeah. what I'm talking yeah. about. Some spy jinx, yeah. I'll just yeah, call, not, I'll not, just call like the that. not like the guy at the end where he's like, my plane is also a satellite, and the satellite is also yeah, no, made you're of about like, and I'm b- also my own brother's son, Mr. Ooh. Bond. Yeah, you're like, like the what? shoe boot. You're talking like a boot with poison on the yeah, knife. Yeah, so I'm talking about yeah, kind of like the, less, <clears throat> the stuff before the end of the Bond movie. Yeah, I get you. Well, continuing on, Gottlieb uh, was just... I'm just saying, point, there was a Bond movie where, where a North Korean man turned into a white dude, and then I no one suspected it. nothing. It was insane. <laughs> it was, it was insane. Movie. Was that the Pierce Brosnan one? Yeah, it's it was the, the last one, Pierce Brosnan it's one. It's the one yeah, where okay. he gets the like glass in his face, remember? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> crazy, I remember that. And there's like, a, oh. there's like a... I remember there's like an ice car chase. Yes, and, and a guy gets killed by an ice sculpture. Yeah. And... A man gets sucked out of a plane and it's and just I can't <laughs> what a movie dude what a masterpiece I of can't cinema. handle that movie it's too much there's like <laughs> well, a level based of, on fact as you've learned now through apparently, apparently it's all based on fact it's and a, just a reminder so, I'm just saying that man was so committed he changed his dick <laughs> He's so his committed. Dick. He was like, "I want you to recreate all of me." It's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. We've I lost Jesse. Up. We've I can't lost get you, over. Jesse. That Come back crazy. to us, man. We, we gotta do, go back we to MK just do Illuminati's about fantasy worlds and Jesse. Yeah, no, that's what we gotta do. <laughs> go but insane, instead, we gotta do real life shit. <laughs> got him now completely empowered by the fact that he got away with a literal accidental or well, maybe not accidental murder. And also remember. His he's at the top of the CIA chain. He has no oversight. The expansion continues. Continuing in 1955, Georgetown University Hospital in Washington announced plans to construct a six story, 100 bed edition called Gorman Annex. Gottlieb got word of such a thing and secretly paid thirty five three hundred seventy five thousand dollars or in 2020 money, three point six million dollars to to the building project disguised as a charitable donation with the following stipulations. One, one sixth of the total space in the new hospital wing will be available to the chemical division of the TSS, thereby providing laboratories and office space, technical assistance, equipment, and experimental animals. Two, what? to justify the expense to CIA superiors, Gottlieb listed four justifications. Agency employees would be able to participate in the work without the University of the Hospital Authorities being aware of agency interest. Agency sponsorship of sensitive research projects will be completely deniable. Full professional cover will be provided for up to three biochemical employees of the chemical division. And human patients and volunteers for experimental use will be available under controlled clinical conditions. These are the four justifications he gave to the CIA, um, basically saying... No one will ever goddamn know, and we're going to have people at our disposal, period. The worst part is we actually know very little about the experiments that actually went on in the Gorman Annex, but it is known that terminally ill patients were among the participants that were brought there. Two decades after it closed down, CIA Director Stansfield Turner 
would say when pressed for details, quote, there is no factual evidence of when, when, what went on. It is just missing. It is not that it didn't happen, end quote. <clears throat> Literally saying, we know it happened. We have no idea what went on. God damn. I mean, that was one it's, of the four points is he literally said, look, yep. no one will know and no one's going to find out. And he was right. The man yeah. sold it well. It, yeah, it was completely correct. At this time as well, magic mushrooms began falling into the fold. The so-called magic mushroom was actually brought to the CIA's attention by a married couple, Valentina and Gordon Wasson. They had made two trips to Mexico in search of the elusive, quote, God's flesh mushroom which had not been successful. But on their third trip in 1955, they met up with a young native person who took them to a Mazatec woman named Mar uh, Maria Sabina. Sabina was known as a guardian of ancient wisdom who used mushrooms to commune with the infinite. On the 29th of June in 1955, Sabina passed out the mushrooms to 20 individuals, including the Wassons, the first non-natives to partake. Gordon recalls the experience as thus, quote, we were never more wide awake and the visions came whether our eyes were open or closed. The effect of the mushrooms is to bring about a fission of the spirit, a split in the person, a kind of schizophrenia with the rational side continuing to reason and to observe the sensations that the other side is enjoying. Literal I want to do this. Literal mad <laughs> scientists at this point. They just the mind is do, attached by an elastic cord to the vagrant they're sense. They're just doing all End kinds quote. of drugs and no one is stopping them and they just keep nope. just trying shit out because they're <laughs> obsessed with drugs and they're like going insane because they're like ingesting drugs and like living a crazy life. The CIA, unsurprisingly, was incredibly eager to get their hands on this for use in MK Ultra. I want so they, to go on that trip. I'm just putting it, it out there. That's how, oh, go, yeah, just get brought like, out like, to the, the Nate Woods and have natives just give you mushrooms. Oh, my God. I mean, like, I would love a, a nice little guide. Yeah, I'd love to have a yeah. guide on that trip. Sure. I would need one. <laughs> <laughs> um. So CIA decided to con uh, end up contacting the Park Davis pharmaceutical firm to find out more. The CIA made an offer. They would be given a chemist that would stay at the firm, but would work for the CIA. And the CIA would pay the chemist's salary. Park Davis, and, uh, Park Davis suggested uh, a man by the name of James Moore. James Moore was a chemist at Park Davis. As a graduate student, Moore had worked on the Manhattan Project. He was... <laughs> I know, All right, I know. Then. That is I a know. resume, yeah. <laughs> he was offered the position and accepted, though later said, quote, if I had thought I was participating in a scheme run by a small band of mad individuals, I would have demurred. I would have taken <laughs> that offer to work on the Metal Gear instead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so basically, he didn't think very highly of the, the CIA at this particular point. Uh, rather, after his work with them. Moore had heard of Wesson's expedition and contacted Gordon about accompanying them on their journey. Moore even offered money from a foundation, and, and that's in air quotes, it was a fake foundation, to fund the trip. And of course, Wasson accepted and was sent $2,000 from the CIA's Geschichter Fund in, uh, for medical research to take Moore along. Wasson, Moore, and two French mycologists returned to Sabina, who agreed to repeat the ceremony for the group. Wasson once again felt the magical effects but Moore did not enjoy it near so much. Moore did not like the dirt floor, was cold and hungry, had diarrhea, and, quote, itched all over. He basically didn't enjoy being out what in the wilderness, the it sounds like. Just, I don't know if he thought he was going to be in, like, a five-star hotel doing these things or what, but... This is like Tommy Lee Jones <clears throat> and Men in Black is what I'm imagining. Is that weird? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that fits. Moore then returned to the CIA with samples of the psychoactive mushrooms. CIA officers had already scouted a mushroom producing area of Pennsylvania and contracted a couple of farmers for help producing this rare fungus. Gottlieb warned them, though, that research in the psychoactive aspect must remain an agency secret. Unfortunately for Marie Maria Sabina, Gordon Wasson was not quiet about his adventures, and the end result was a 17 page spread in Life magazine where Wasson described his experiences and named the town where they were performed. This resulted in hordes of curious Americans traipsing into Mexico for a lick of the magic mushroom. So we just utterly destroyed their way of life. So, but this is like <laughs> how the magic mushroom came into mainstream America. media. Yep. 
Interesting. I was literally just watching a thing um, to like yesterday about the same thing happening to a fucking toad. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause you want the one where you can lick. No, it's like this dude, this dude, Hamilton has the show on vice where he like went into the jungle. It's like a travel show for food, but it's like drugs. And he like went to the jungle to find this like famous psychedelic toad and smoked the like stuff that comes out of the toad when you squeeze the toad's glands. Oh God. And it like, he went, had this like insane experience and it like sent people out there in droves. Ugh, yep. So, yep. so to like correct it, he like learned how to, he's a biochemist and he learned how to synthesize the chemical that the toad secretes. So as to, have enough for anybody who would ever need it without ever needing to like poach a toy. Yeah. A life. Yeah. Oh, at least, at least he tried to, he made that step here. He just did a spread in life, probably enjoyed the fame and ruined an entire village. 17 and, uh, pages on psychedelic mushrooms. Yep. Seven, on his whole experience going there, like his whole trip was like the 17. That must have felt spread. like reading a science fiction story in the fifties. Yeah. And that's how we end 1955 though. The introduction of mushrooms into the uh, the greater American culture in a way. And going into 1956, con- the agency continues to spread. We're going to start with the Mansfield proposal. And on the April 9th of 1956, a man by the name of Mike, or sorry, a senator by the name of Mike Mansfield of Montana addressed his colleagues saying the following, quote, because of the very nature of the Central Intelligence Agency, I think it is important that a joint congressional committee be established for the purpose of of making continued studies of the activities of the agency. The CIA should, as a matter of law, keep that committee as fully and as currently informed as possible with respect to its activities. Alan Dulles, director of CIA, may make no mistakes in assessing intelligence, but he should not be the lone judge, end quote. So basically in 1956, a senator stepped up and be like, hey, who watches the watchers? Who's keeping tabs on the CIA? We need to be making a committee. Now, Obviously, those who within the, uh, within the uh, CIA were not happy about that at all. But Mansfield still proposed a 12-man congressional committee that would, one, make continuing studies of the activities of the Central Intelligence Agency, two, require the CIA to keep the joint committee fully and currently informed with respect to its activities, and three, give the committee power to require, by subpoena or otherwise, the attendance of such witnesses and the production of such books, papers, and documents as it deems advisable. So just basically an oversight committee. In his speech, the senator mentioned reports that the agency had funded neo-Nazis in Germany, <laughs> organized militia raids inside China, yeah, what about sent, that? Agents, sent agents to, quote, start a revolution in Guatemala, tapped the telephone of President Jose Figueres of Costa, uh, Costa Rica, and illegally detained, quote, a Japanese citizen for eight months, all of which turned out to be true. And he said, Mansfield and he said, is, and what, bitch? Yeah, really, he just continually was like, "There's here's a night, and he's like, a bunch of reasons these people need oversight. Publicly, Eisenhower insisted that he, too, wanted tighter oversight of the CIA. But behind closed doors, Eisenhower told aides that Mansfield bill would pa- be passed, quote, over my dead body, end quote. Why? Why? Because <laughs> he didn't think that it was needed. It was power. It's just Eisenhower so- named an eight-member committee. The president, the president's board of consultants on foreign intelligence activities that he said would monitor the CIA and let him know if anything was amiss. Now, probably to your surprise, this didn't really wasn't the, the board's purpose in any way. One of the agency's most powerful supporters in Congress, Senator Richard Russell of Georgia, announced that his armed services committee, which was charged with reviewing the CIA budget, would establish a new subcommittee to review the agency's activities which I don't understand how that passed. I don't know how that went by the dude, like one of the agency's most powerful supporters is like, I got this guys. Don't worry. Of course, in a letter to one of his colleagues, Russell made it clear that he did not intend whatsoever to review the review rather to be any more intrusive than what his committee had been already doing all these years. So basically saying, don't worry, nothing's going to change. After three days of debate, there was still support for Mansfield proposal to the CIA's dismay. But due to pressure from the CIA and the White House, 12 of the 37 co-sponsors removed their names from the proposal and then opposed it. 
Eisenhower pressured Senate leaders to do whatever necessary to ensure that it did not pass. Russell asserted that it would be better to abolish the CIA than to subject it to possibly unfriendly oversight. But the proposal what a bunch of in the dingle what, what year was this? What year was 1956. this? 1956. 56. Hmm. Okay, I was yep. trying to I was trying to think about when McCarthy was, and that was up until 54. So I mean, like during this whole time period, we're still in peak Cold War, where they're like all means are justified. Let's yeah, doesn't even matter. Much. We have to we'll burn down entire nations to defeat communism. <laughs> they don't think about they don't think about the ripple effect of what might happen to though, like leaving these things unchecked for, I don't know, decades at a time. It's just uh, it, it, the, the original intention, which I still don't even fully grok is like so far gone. It's literally just like wizards going crazy on their potions <laughs> in a shop yeah. at this point. It's like nonsense it's a good analogy. Yeah. But so by the end, though, because of the, the pressure from um, the CIA and the White House, the proposal lost by a 59 to 27 margin. I cannot believe that. So disheartening. Now, well, all you had to do was same thing today. All you had to do was call people socialists or communists. And everyone was like, oh, no, yeah, it's super that's easy. not me. I'm a yep. good American. It's like, oh, boy, here we go. And things would continue now from this point on in MK Ultra, undeterred for years all the way up to 1960 for three years everything that we talked about is now just happening as and though we, it is just and we still don't know what it was exactly we do not know what it was that everything that we talked about at the very least never mind what they were doing at black sites across the world outside of the u.s borders we touched upon what they were doing prior to mk ultra we don't really know what they were doing afterward other than maybe continued experimentation that is some big bad boo-boo daddy right there that is so bad yeah but MK Ultra started to bubble up to the surface of public thought in 1960, thanks to the Francis Powers incident. In the spring of 1960, a man by the name of Francis Gary Powers crashed in the Ural Mountains in Soviet Russia. Powers was flying. Oh, this is, a, uh, what's it, what's it called, right? Yep. Bridge of Spies. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We're going to talk about Bridge of Spies and the differences in the fact versus what was actually fiction. Powers was flying a secret U-2 spy plane and was struck down by a Soviet anti-aircraft missile. He managed to, to eject from the destroyed plane carrying a token from Gottlieb and MK Ultra and his colleagues. It was a silver dollar concealing a pin coated in poison. And this particular token would be the precipice that let everybody know in the U.S. that MK Ultra was doing some shit. The pins themselves were coated in a paralytic known uh, as sexiotoxin i'm sorry saxotoxin sex toxin it's a sub just sex toxin i wish that's what they were doing in san francisco but <laughs> uh, this was not not it this was a substance extracted from infected shellfish it is related to the algae oh. that causes red tides and other waterborne waterborne infections what it in highly concentrated doses such as the one concealed in the silver dollar it kills within seconds these pins were given to all spy pilots, but contrary to the scene from the 2016 film Bridge of Spies, they were not instructed to use them immediately upon discovery. Powers would say later, because he didn't use it, uh, he would later use the uh, say later about the use of the pin, quote, it was more or less up to me, uh, end quote. Powers, of course, opted not to use it. After the crash, the CIA began to concoct a cover story. Presuming that Powers was dead and the plane vaporized, the government insisted that a research plane studying high-altitude weather patterns over Turkey had run into trouble. The pilot lost consciousness due to a lack of oxygen, and the plane had continued on autopilot, drifting into Soviet airspace, where it subsequently crashed and disappeared. What they didn't know is that there were still parts of the plane, and they were discovered. Though the CIA and Eisenhower considered the matter settled, Khrushchev had the last word. In a speech to the Supreme Soviet a week after the crash, he revealed that large sections of the plane had survived, Powers was alive, and the poison pin had been discovered. Eisenhower was forced then to admit that he had authorized his spokesman to lie about the U-2 test flight and the crash in Soviet, it was like, uh, in Soviet space. It was like, okay, maybe somebody should be watching and making sure I don't do dumb shit like this. <laughs> But the only reason why they admitted to any of it is because they got caught. Exactly. That's exactly they it. They never would have said anything if Russia wasn't like, we're about to blow you up, dog. We're about to put yeah. this on blast. 
They're like, Powers all right, in, you got us. Powers being caught in Russia was then put on trial in Moscow. The prosecutor's opening statement asserted, quote, if the assignments received by Powers had not been of a criminal nature, his masters would not have supplied him with a lethal pin, end quote. And in 1962, two years after the crash, Powers was eventually traded for a Russian spy and he faced a burst of criticism for failing to use his suicide pin. But after the tensions eventually so cooled, misguided. He was a, yeah, after the tensions eventually cooled though, they eventually hailed him for his service and eventually gave him a medal. How long did he have to wait for the medal? Uh his oh, uh, I didn't write down what year his medal like, was. Like did he get the medal oh, in like 1998 know. or some shit? Yeah, I guarantee it wasn't yeah. given to him <laughs> during the same administration, yeah. that's for yeah. sure. You can probably Google that. You could probably yeah. Google that. That's just the wrap of power story though. We we're going to stick in 1960 for a little bit. Because we were also at this time running many different things, continuing assassination attempts across the world. On August 18th, 1960, Alan Dulles and Richard Bissell made an unscheduled trip to the White House with an urgent cable from contacts in the Congo. He said, quote, Embassy and station believe that Congo experiencing the, Co the Congo is experiencing classic communist effort takeover government. Anti-West forces rapidly increase increasing power in Congo and therefore may be little time left, end quote. Officials feared that Lumumba, who was the one ruling, uh, the prime minister ruling over in there at the time, was about to deliver his country to the Soviets. During the meeting, an, of, an official note taker recalled Eisenhower turned to Dulles and said the following, quote, something to the effect that Lumumba should be eliminated. The note taker continues, there was a stunned silence for about 15 seconds, and then the meeting continued. It's like the I born identity. Yep, that's really, it was like a meeting. You know, you could see Eisenhower kind of pacing and just being like, that's it. We have to kill him. We can't have Guatemala, uh, we can't have Costa Rica or the Congo fall into Soviet hands. As soon as Bissell returned to his office from the meeting, he called Lep I'm gonna, yeah, Leppoldville and began brainstorming ways to remove, remove Lumumba's obstacle. At first, a sniper was considered, but as the prime minister was living in seclusion and no reliable sniper was available, Poison was then the next thing brought up and was given the green light. On September 26, 1960, Gottlieb arrived in the Congolese capital of Leopoldville with supplies to assassinate Prime Minister Patrice Lumumba. <laughs> Gottlieb's... <laughs> sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, we I'm lost just, you, Alex. I'm just, I'm just like bummed. I'm just like, God damn it. That's all. <laughs> Would you like to know, gentlemen, what Gottlieb's poisoner's kit contained? Yes, please. <laughs> A hypodermic syringe with an ultra thin needle might sound familiar. The ones being tested at the pad right. or the pad sequel, the pad two. a small jar of chlorine that could be mixed with botulinum botulinum to render it ineffective in an emergency and quote accessory materials, including protective gloves and a face mask to be worn while conducting the operation. Gottlieb remained in Leppoldville for 10 days while he waited for his contact to find an agent then returned to Washington. The mission was passed on to a man by the name of Larry Devlin, CIA station chief with a cover job as a consular officer at the American embassy. Gottlieb instructed Devlin to get an inside man to use the hypodermic needle to inject the uh, botulinum into something that would be put into Lumumba's mouth, whether that be food or a toothbrush. Devlin dispatched a man to pierce Lumumba's inner circle and deposit the toxin. Devlin's agent proved unable to pass the rings of security, so Devlin began to explore other options. He knew that the Belgian officials were just as determined to remove Lumumba as the Americans, and so he devised a plan. On November 29, 1960, Lumumba fled uh, from Leppoldville to his enemy, and his enemies ended up finding him. He spent six weeks in a remote jail, and on the 17th of January 1961, a squad of six Congolese and two Belgian officers took Lumumba out of the jail, into the jungle, and shot him. Then God. dissolved his body in acid. Like Breaking Bad? Yep. God damn Correct. it, dude. So that was how they ended up using it. Uh, they just kind of got together with his enemies and devised a plan to capture him, shoot him, and... Uh, melt them down. MK Ultra. Uh, the head of MK Ultra is the one leading these these plans. By the way, in case 
people don't know why MK Ultra is involved here. So literally Gottlieb is, is coming up with this shit. Can we re- rewind a hot sec yep. back to you two? I had to do the research. I had to look it up. Oh, yeah, All right. please. Uh, he received his awards in 1965. He got the intelligence star from the CIA. OK, so three um, years. So not too bad. However, I found a thing that we didn't talk about that I am blown away by. So as we discussed the entire incident, the CIA was like, keep it quiet, go on the news. We got to lie about a bunch of stuff. Apparently the biggest lie they had to pull off though, was the pilot and his wife at the time were going through some stuff. And his Mm. wife was uh, having an affair with another dude. And when this all went down, she had just broken her leg while dancing at a club with this guy. And so they had to bring her on TV and create a whole story. And so they drugged this woman. <laughs> what? To ma- they drugged her. Uh, specifically, they gave her um, uh, all sorts of like downers. Essentially, they yep. gave her sedatives before speaking with any press And she was supposed to repeat what they gave her to say as a devoted wife, even though she was like out and about when he was flying. And what happened was she broke her leg. So they had to make a whole story, a whole fiction that she was skiing at the time. So they had to like plant photos. (laughs) She was skiing at the time, broke her leg, even though none of that happened because they were like, all right, we have to cover all of this. So they made a whole fake story for his wife. Incredible. We have to blitz through some shit, brother. We have to. We're already an hour in and I'm not where I thought I would be. (laughs) It's so mind blowing. The lengths that was they did to cover this up. They literally like, all right, drug the wife and let's create a whole false identity and backstory for what she was doing the last three weeks. Go. And they did. And they did. I know. MK Ultra was like (laughs) ruling our foreign policy affairs for this time in a weird way. In a lot of ways. It's nuts. We got to keep going, though. So Lamumba got killed. So what happened to the unused poison? Well, Devlin later wrote that after Gottlieb handed it over to him, quote, my mind was racing. I realized that I could never assassinate Lamumba. It would have been murder. My plan was to stall, to delay as long as possible in the hope that Lamumba would wither, would wither or fade away politically as a, p- a potential danger or that the Congolese would succeed in taking him prisoner, which they eventually did. <laughs> He was just praying that he wasn't going to have to like needle this dude. Yep. Yep. He didn't want to do it to secure the poison. Devlin locked it inside his office safe where it would lose potency over time. Gottlieb, however, testified later that he had disposed of the poison before leaving Leopoldville, destroying its viability and then dumping it in the Congo river. So we have two varying stories on what actually happened with the poison. We don't know. Then MK Ultra also was touching the attempted assassinations, the many attempted assassinations of Fidel Castro. As Cuba became more and more of a concern for the U.S., it's not surprising that the minds that were in control of MK Ultra would be brought in to try and deal with him. Several ideas were considered to remove Castro from power. Some you might know, some you might not. Spray aerosol. Uh, one of the main ones was to spray aer- aerosolized LSD in the radio station where Castro made live speeches <laughs> to millions of Cubans. <laughs> Wasn't there something about an exploding cat or something? <laughs> we'll get there. Yeah. Uh, we'll the idea get was there. That- this is a. This isn't just an Alex thing. This is what a do you mean really an Alex cat? thing? What's an Alex you thing? You know a what I mean? Thing? A cool thing? You know- we're not going to, I don't think we're going to touch on the exploding cat. I have heard of the exploding cat though. It's something. Uh, There's something looking, about, all right, you go. I'm the looking idea, this up. The idea about the aer- aerosolized LSD was that Castro would become disoriented and incoherent during one of those speeches and would lose popular support. This idea was discarded as impractical and aerosolized LSD was never sent into Cuba. Their next idea was even further kind of interesting. They presumed that Castro's popularity stemmed from his facial hair and that if he lost the beard, he would also lose his like political Samson? favor and the love of his citizens. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it wasn't a cat. It was his cigar. It was an, ex- yes, there was it some- was an exploding cigar. Yes. Yes. There is. We're going to talk about cigars here in a minute. Yeah. But, but first is his beard, my friend. Uh, the plot became to sprinkle thallium into Castro's boots which, uh, which he left outside his hotel room often to be shined. This would cause his beard to fall out, leaving him open to ridicule and political weakness. 
However, this plan's obvious weakness was that no one knew when Castro would be traveling, and even if he stayed at a hotel that the CIA could penetrate, his security detail would likely not let just anyone handle Castro's boots. And so they aborted this plan as well. They're like, they keep getting foiled by like, oh shit, yeah, uh, guards. Fuck. Yes, right. Yes. So frustrated that they can't destroy his political career, they thought, well, maybe we'll just try killing him outright instead. The first idea was to poison Castro's cigars. The plot was to contaminate a box of 50 cigars and get them to an operations team who could then get them to Castro. This plan got so far as the cigars actually being tampered with and, see- and sealed in a box. Oh, man. They were passed on to a CIA office worker who locked them in a safe. No way was actually ever found to deliver them to Castro, however. And seven years later, one tested cigar was still found to have a 94% potency to it. That's, that's the holy grail very of clear. memorabilia right there. Yeah. <laughs> to be very clear, this happened one year after Castro took power. Yep. Yeah, this wasn't like, even a wait and guy. let's see what this guy's yeah. about. They were like, no. we know what he is. We're killing him. It was like, Whoa, yeah, we need to get rid of him. One <laughs> year. We were like, poison his food, sneakily kill him. It's just crazy. The next plot tickles the greater subject of Alex's next great project. Another plot thought up under the Kennedy administration was to put a bomb in a rare seashell and plant it where Castro liked to scuba dive. <laughs> This idea, (laughs) this idea was rejected as impractical. Quote, none of the shells that might conceivably be found in the Caribbean Ocean was both spectacular enough to be sure of attracting attention and large enough to hold the needed amount of explosive. The midget submarine that would have had to be used to in placement of the shell was too short uh, an operating range for such an operation. It's so cockamamie. Every single one is cockamamie, dude. That's like Hitman, like... That's like Hitman rules. Yes. Oh, yes. my God. That is a Hitman plot. Yes, it is. <laughs> Scuba diving to replace a shell to attract the attention of. A- we know he's going to oh go diving God. here. And his favorite thing is the black and white spotted snail. But this one's going to be <laughs> explosive. <laughs> it's so good. Another plot under the Kennedys was to have lawyer James Donovan negotiate for the release of American prisoners in Cuba the CIA would give Donovan a tainted diving suit to present to Castro. This plan was foiled when the lawyer decided to give Castro a different diving suit. Quote, technical services division bought a diving suit, dusted it inside with a fungus, which would would produce Madura foot, a chronic skin disease, and contaminated the breathing apparatus with tubercle bacillus. What? They were going to give him a skin (laughs) disease and tuberculosis? (laughs) <laughs> yeah. yep 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 from that, a diving again, suit though, literally the reason he didn't it didn't go through is because the donovan was like hey, i'm gonna give him a different this suit. is a stupid suit <laughs> other possible options considered but didn't fully go through the uh, like the planning phases were something highly toxic toxic such as a shelf a shellfish poison to be administered with a pin a bacterial material bacterial material in liquid form Bacterial treatment of a cigarette or cigar or a handkerchief treated with bacteria. <laughs> you know, a lot of bacteria out there. Attempts to remove Castro from power through chemical means continued until the Johnson administration decided to proceed with political and economic means of destabilizing Castro's regime. Johnson concluded, quote, we had been operating a goddamn murder inc in, in the Caribbean, end quote, and put an end to the assassination plots altogether. Do you? Do you not have the one about his lover? No, what? that's not on. That's not part of. Give me two script. Two seconds. I know the one of the two. lever. I don't. Was I that have MK to read Ultra? this to y'all. It's crazy. I got to keep in mind. There were assassination attempts that were happening that were not MK Ultra driven. All right. This is this has to be, though. So because you said they they were using botulism toxin, right? Uh, did, they, uh, did I say that they were using botulism well, toxin? Well, they knew- this. All right. Here you go. Uh. One of his lovers, Marita Lorenz, uh, in 1993, told Vanity Fair that while she was Castro's lover in the uh, late 50s, she was recruited by the CIA and tasked with assassinating the Cuban leader. She was given two botulism toxin pills to drop in Castro's drink. So her story goes just one would have killed him in 30 seconds, but she got cold feet. 
I knew the minute I saw the outline of Havana, I simply couldn't do it, she told Vanity Fair, describing her emotions upon landing back in the Cuban capital. Even if she had wanted to kill him, she botched the job. Apparently, she yep. stored the pills improperly, and they became gunky and unusable. But Castro found out. He leaned over, put a forty-five in her hand, and he was like, "Oh, I do know the story. Yes, kill me." And she, she, she couldn't do it, and he didn't even flinch. And he said, "You can't kill me. Nobody can kill me." What the <laughs> yes, fuck? Holy, I do know the story. So, that's crazy. Um, yes, that's okay. So it's important to remind you, um, the CIA was doing their own things and they were tapping MK Ultra to come up with other things as well. So that was a CIA plot, not an MK Ultra driven wanna, one. I just want to let you yes, know that, that's such that a the good way story. the story ends is he's like, you can't kill me. Nobody can kill me. He then smiled, chewed on his cigar. I felt deflated. He was so sure of himself. He grabbed me and we made love. <laughs> Get the fuck <laughs> out of here. So good. I love it. She's like, well, I'm not going to not have sex with moment. Castro. That's messed up. <laughs> oh God. Okay. Anyway, so that ends that ends the MK Ultra's plans to try and assassinate Castro. After the failures of the U2 fiasco, the Bay of Pigs, a failure to predict the construction of the Berlin Wall, Kennedy fired Dulles from his position as CIA director. God now I don't know damn. how far in, now I don't know how far you are into the Kennedy thing, but this does tangent spiral off. To one of the conspiracy theories that this is what ended up getting Kennedy yeah, the, assassinated. Yeah, like revenge plot one. Yeah, like a revenge because remember Dulles was th Dulles was the one that basically said, "Okay, MK Ultra, you can do whatever the fuck you want, and nobody's going to stop right. you." Right now, he's being booted. Kennedy was like, he's being "What are you replaced. doing? You can't do <laughs> that." <laughs> he's being replaced by John McCone, who had been the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commissions. McCone began his regime by immediately shaking up the team he deemed responsible for the CIA's recent failures. He organized an early retirement for Bissell, the Ooh. deputy director for, uh, for plans who had presided, presided over the Bay of Pigs. Richard Helms was promoted to the newly vacated position. Helms reshuffled the technical services division, making Gottlieb deputy chief. And from here, Gottlieb moved more into the tinkering aspect of CIA spydom. He oh. began to design... He began to design things that we uh, we would associate today with spy gear. And he, from this point on, mo was moved away from MKUltra. This and makes a lot of sense because uh, you mentioned mm -hmm. Bay of Pigs. Like after that failure, they were like, F it, scrap. Like these ideas are terrible. And they yep. fired everybody. Somebody so it finally makes a lot was of sense. like, wait, what the fuck are we doing? Like, what are we yeah. doing? This is crazy. Yep. It's mm -hmm. exactly like 1960 begins the fall of MK Ultra because MK Ultra is no longer technically a thing by 1963. It lasted about a decade. God damn. It's like the Beatles, but like the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the opposite. Exactly. The, the, these horrible people who have crazy minds are still working in the government. Mind you, they're still doing shit. They're just not doing MK Ultra anymore. In 1960, Gottlieb wrote another memo entitled scientific and technical problems in covert action operations, which contented a telling sentence or contained rather a, a telling sentence. Quote, as of 1960, no effective knockout pill, truth serum, aphrodisiac, or recruitment pill was known to exist, immediately implicating that all of the research they had been doing at MKUltra had been completely and utterly fruitless. <laughs> yep. <laughs> womp, womp, now, Gottlieb womp. continued to direct MKUltra post-1960. The scale was greatly reduced, and experiments with LSD had ceased though this did not prevent it from escaping into American society and creating the entire 1960s counterculture. <laughs> no more funds were funneled into research, into, ele uh, into research, into electroshock and other extreme measures. And Gottlieb had found out how to destroy the human mind. Uh, Gottlieb had, had found out how to destroy the human mind, but was never able to rewrite the blank slate with a more useful personality. Literally, all he learned was torture methods. That's all he ever figured out. But also, he engineered his own cultural destruction by creating hippies. Yep. Yep. He did. They were the creators of their own monster. Kind of weird. That's kind of, he keeps happening in society. <laughs> At this point, McCone still wasn't aware of MK Ultra, but 1961 saw all of that change. And in an effort to professionalize MK Ultra, as he would call it, he created a new directorate for science and technology and ordered it to take over the behavioral work technical, uh, technical services that had been already doing, basically MKUltra. 
Afraid the, uh, the, the true extremes of the experiments would be discovered, Helms and Gottlieb persuaded McCone that MKUltra should be protected, even from those with top secret clearance. McCone eventually grew suspicious of MKUltra and ordered the CIA's Inspector General, J.S. Ehrman, to find out what it was and what it did. Hmm. Ehrman then came to four direct conclusions that he presented. Research in the manipulation of human behavior is considered by many authorities in the medicine and related fields to be professionally unethical. Therefore, the reputations of professional participants in the MKUltra program are, uh, are on occasion in jeopardy. Some MKUltra activities raise questions of legal legality implicit in the original charter. A final phase of the testing of MKUltra products places the rights and interests of U.S. citizens in jeopardy. Public disclosure of some aspects of MKUltra activity could induce serious adverse reaction in the U.S. public opinion, as well as stimulate offensive and defensive action in this field on the part of foreign intelligence services. People will get, like, sure. really mad at us, bro, if they find out that yeah. we were, like, breaking Correct. international laws, dog. Weighing possible benefits of such testing against the risks of compromise and of resulting damage to CIA has led the Inspector General to recommend termination of this phase of the MK Ultra program. So those are the four things. Yeah, basically, these are the everything we already know. He kind of discovered on his look through it. Sure. Ehrman also suggested a series of steps to bring MK Ultra under tighter control. Contracts should be audited. Gottlieb should file regular updates describing his work. Project managers should update their notab uh, notably incomplete files, and a redefinition of the scope of MK Ultra is now appropriate. So basically, they had income like they would never finish their files because it was all shit that they didn't want people to find out. And rather than fight back, surprisingly, Gottlieb just accepted the report and even suggested that Ehrman was not critical enough of MK Ultra. And Gottlieb suggested that rather than redefining the scope of MK Ultra, let the program fade away entirely. Whether this was an admission of defeat, a, protect, a protective measure, or both is really up to anyone's speculation because that's what ended up happening with MKUltra. And in 1962, things continually winded down for the program. In 1962, though, MKUltra's biggest victim came forward. Jolly West, who had presided over some of MKUltra's sub-projects, arrived at the Lincoln Park Zoo in Oklahoma City. On an arrangement with the zoo director, he shot a dart filled with 300,000 micrograms of LSD into the flank of a 7,000-pound bull elephant named Tusco. No! <laughs> Five minutes later, Tusco, quote, trumpeted, collapsed, Died. fell heavily onto his right side, defecated, and went into status epilepticus. West administered a cocktail of other drugs, including depressants, to offset the LSD, but it did no good, and Tusco was euthanized an hour and 40 minutes after being drugged. Oh my god. Thus, what the fuck? Him, the elephant, becoming dubbed the biggest victim of MK Ultra. That's so fucking stupid. Yeah, he just like went and poisoned dumb. an elephant one day because he was like, they were like fuck out, it. You gotta think, they're a year away from being closed down. Their budget has gotta be getting low. They're like, fuck, what do we do? We still got drugs. We Whoa. still gotta try and test things. I've always wanted to poison a fucking elephant. You know what? Genius, we're sending you to the to zoo. Get pack your what shit. What do you think You're it was gonna tomorrow. do? Like, get up and be like, thank you for awakening me, master. How may I destroy <laughs> your enemies for you? I don't know, dude, because we don't know. We don't know what their, what their thought was. It All just we know was like a lot, though. They shot him with a lot. 300,000 like, micrograms. A lot. That's that seems insane. Like that. And then other drugs after that. Uh, 1963 then dawned, and the Kubark Counterintelligence Interrogation Manual was finally born. And you know, we relied on that and followed it to the T for the rest of all human history. Laws were instituted exactly. to stop us from doing anything like this ever again. And we never created black sites or waterboarded again. <laughs> exactly. We were on the up and up. The Kubark, the CIA cryptogram for itself, counterintelligence interrogation manual, was discovered in 1963 and contained many of the techniques and insights from MK MKUltra. So again, remember, we don't have a lot of the, the documents from MKUltra. Here's where we got a lot of what they at least figured out. In 1983, a new version was introduced with similar instruction to the original 
designed for use by military-dominated governments in Latin America. The Human Resources Exploitation Training Manual, as it was called. Good up. Lord. <laughs> Among the, ten the tenets cribbed from MK Ultra are the following. A man's sense of identity depends upon a continuity in his surroundings, habits, appearance, actions, relations with others, etc. The tension permits the interrogator to cut through these links. Control of the, source envi the source's environment permits the interrogator to determine his diet, sleep pattern, and other fundamentals, manipulating these into, into, reg into irregularities so that the subject becomes disoriented is very likely to create feelings of fear and helplessness. The chief effect of arrest and detention, and particularly uh, of solitary confinement, is to deprive the subject of many or most of the sounds, tastes, smells, and tactile sensations to which he has grown accustomed to. Results produced only weeks after or months of imprisonment in an ordinary cell can be duplicated in hours or days in a cell which has no light or artificial light, which never varies, which is soundproofed, in which odors are eliminated, etc. An environment still more subject to control, such as a water tank or iron lung, is even more effective. Drugs can be effective in overcoming resistance not dissolved by other techniques. The principal co uh, coercive technique are, uh, techniques are arrest, detention, the deprivation of sensory stimuli, threats and fear, debility, pain, heightened suggestibility, and hypnosis, and drugs. The official effect of coercion is regression. The interrogatee's mature defenses crumble as he becomes more childlike. The electric current should be known in advance so that transformers and other modifying devices will be on hand if needed. The profound moral objection to applying duress past the point of irreversible psychological damage has been stated. Judging the validity of the of other ethical arguments about coercion exceeds the scope of this it's paper. It's like the opposite of the anarchist cookbook. Yep. Over the final months of 1963, MK Ultra slowly faded away. Projects were ended and not renewed. The safe houses were closed. Gottlieb threw himself fully into his work in the technical services division, moving on from poisons right into spy gear. And the MK Ultra contractors also moved around. Dr. Ewan Cameron wanted to cure schizophrenia a strangely common justification for the experiments bankrolled by the CIA's MKUltra. Cameron favored a method known as depatterning, defining the method as breaking up existing patterns of behavior, both the normal and the schizophrenic, by means of particularly intense electroshocks, usually combined with a prolonged drug-induced sleep. These are the things that, again, we spoke about a little bit over, and the details of which are just not all that important. We don't need to know the the measurements of the drugs and whatnot and exactly how things went about. Another person, Harris Isbell, was a director of Addiction Research Center in Lexington, Kentucky, and Isbell was interested in the effects of LSD. He had conducted truth serum experiments for the Office of Naval Research in early 1953, and he sent a request to the CIA for, quote, a reasonably large quantity of the drug for a study of the mental and other pharmacological pharmacological effects produced by the chronic administration of the dithyl amide of lysergic acid. Oh, these names. What, for, what now? Pardon? Oh, God. Let me try that one more time. <clears throat> dithyl amide of lysergic acid. And what is that? Uh, this, is the, this is what they were using to study pharmacological effects produced by chronic administration of it. So you're just looking at what it did. His request was granted. It's a psychological drug, psychoactive drug. It's like another fucking... So they just want to like, our study is to see yes, what it does what it, to people. Yes, yes, yes that's, that's, whole, that's exactly whole correct. Ultra. That's the whole thing. Fancy worded. Let's see what this does. Wouldn't it be cool <laughs> if, wouldn't it be fucked up if? Isbell's MK Ultra contracts included testing whether LSD, mescaline, or other drugs could make users more susceptible to hypnosis, perform preclinical pre pharmacology studies required to develop new psychochemicals, and study psycho, psycho, oh my God, these words are so hard. You got this. Psychotomimetic, psychotomimetic, set psychotomimetic drugs, a class that produces delusions and delirium. It's basically a type of psychotic that does that. Isbell went on to write or, or co-author more than 100 scientific articles, many of them reporting the results of his experiments. 
In his or early articles, he refers to his inmate patients as volunteers, completely lying about who he was testing these things on. The inmates were not told what sort of drug they would be fed or what its effects might be. And to attract them, Isbell offered rewards, including doses of high-grade heroin to feed the habit that the inmates were ultimately there to break. He literally were feeding drug addicts the drug of choice to get them to do their LSD experiments. It's just... In prison. It just doesn't make sense that anybody ever needs to do this. Agreed. One article contained the experience of one volunteer who, quote, felt that he would die or would become permanently insane after being given 180 micrograms of LSD. He asked not to be dosed again and required, quote, considerable persuasion before he eventually agreed to continue taking the LSD. One experiment consisted of five male black patients where he steadily increased the dosage of LSD up to 300 micrograms. That's like almost half what they put in a fucking elephant. I know. God. No, no. They put 300,000 micrograms in an elephant. No. Yeah. Yes, that that's what I was saying. It seems like a little overkill. Yeah. Uh, the elephant got 300,000. <laughs> Quote, the mental effects of LSD 25 were very striking. They included anxiety, a feeling of unreality, feelings of electric shocks on the skin, tingling sensations, choking, marked changes in visual perception were reported, and these included blurring of vision, abnormal coloration of familiar objects like hands turning purple or green, flickering shadows, dancing dots of light, and spinning circles of color. Frequently, inanimate objects were distorted and changed in size. One experiment became known as one of the most extreme in the history of LSD research. Gottlieb wanted to test the effect of heavy doses over an extended period of time. So Isbell selected seven patients, isolated them, and began the experiments. And by patients, I mean inmates. In the, in the, uh, in the document, he says, quote, I have seven patients who have been taking the drug for 42 days. What? Isbell reported that he was giving them double, triple, and quadruple doses. The experiment continued for a total of 77 days. One patient, Eddie Flowers, a 19-year-old African-American drug addict, recalls this experiment saying, it was the worst shit I ever had. Flowers suffered through the hours of overwhelming hallucinations because he wanted the dose of heroin that Isbell offered him at the end as a reward. What the fuck were we doing? <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know how to answer that question anymore. It's just everything that you say, like surprises me each time that it's, yeah. it's, it's crazy. 77 days on LSD. Continually doubling and tripling and quadrupling a bag of heroin the heroin in front of him the whole time. Yeah. Harris Isbell went on to then get this. I mean, you're not going to be surprised. I'm just, you're not going to be surprised. But Isbell went on to be awarded the U.S. Public Health Services uh, Meritorious Service Award and was praised by Attorney General Robert Kennedy as, quote, an outstanding investigator. He then left the Addiction Research Center in Lexington, Kentucky, and went on to become a professor of medicine and pharmacology at the University of Kentucky. In 1975, after MK Ultra was discovered, he was called to testify at a hearing conducted by subcommittees of the Senate Judiciary Committee and the Senate Committee on Labor and Public Welfare, which were investigating human use experimentation programs of the Department of Defense and Central Intelligence Agency, which is how we know exactly what was going on. So he got to go live a normal life for about two decades, for about 22, 23 years. After all of this, I just don't. Just, and then he just got brought in for cross examination or and whatnot, but he didn't get sent to prison or anything. I just don't get it. It's just, I mean, I do get it. I, I lived through this year, but it's just so crazy. How, how does it make you feel to like know that the things kind of in a way, the things we're going through now in 2020 are just things that have just never stopped happening. It's, uh, you know, it doesn't feel great. It's very much like, the thing that brings people to this concept, right? Like to, to this type mm -hmm. of genre of it's probably why people are listening to this podcast is because slowly as you get older, I think, or, you know, as you get access to more information, you just start to realize yeah. that there's, 
so much that you are being naive about and that there must be some higher power at work or something like that. So you have to, you know, go down all these like really crazy rabbit holes until you find something that works out for you in some way. Yeah. And then, and then the only, only to find out that the only reason these people were able to do what they did is because they stumbled into positions of power and were able to eliminate oversight. Yeah. This is why I write episodes about, uh, pie. <laughs> I need to do aliens. Yeah. Soon. Let's continue. <laughs> So you admit that it's ridiculous and that this real stuff is terrifying is what you're saying. Yeah, exa- exactly. I just no, like exactly. pie more than torture. <laughs> right. No, I like just, it. I like that, that Mathis said aliens are adjacent to pie on this spectrum of well, delicious. The aliens are more satisfying. Yeah. Yeah. Real? yeah. Of the, the, the delicious just, spectrum, aliens are delicious. You don't yeah. ever they stop wanting be, more, I'd, you know? Yeah. I'm going to leave this and you may interpret as you may, as you may, but I'd, I'd eat an alien. I would too. <laughs> I would. I, I would wouldn't. eat my neighbor. Yeah. I would. I, I wouldn't <laughs> even think twice. I eat my neighbor. Another man we're going to quickly t- cover is a man by the name of Kyle Pfeiffer. In a lot of ways, <laughs> he ate Pfeiffer, his neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In a lot of ways, Pfeiffer was Gottlieb's pet prison doctor. If that gives you any ideas to the kind of man this guy was, he was the chairman of the Department of Pharmacology at Emory University. His subjects were inmates of the federal prison in Atlanta and a juvenile detention center in Bordentown, New Jersey. He stuttered. He ended up studying the following things. Ways that various depressant drugs can shake a person's psyche by either altering his metabolism or producing sedation. Ways to test the presence uh, depressants, which affect the central nervous system. Ways to screen and evaluate hallucinogenic materials of interest to technical services. <laughs> and now... James Whitey Bulger gets involved a little bit here. I can't even believe How? where we're at. Now you might, you might, a lot of people already <sighs> probably know this, but if you don't, Whitey Bulger was a Boston gangster who was later sentenced, sentenced to life imprisonment for crimes, including 11 like murders. Pretty recently. Like, like, Wh- like Whitey Bulger is a guy we, I want to cover a hundred percent. He was a street level thug in his mid twenties. And uh, when he was sent to the uh, Atlanta federal penitentiary for armed robbery and true hijack and truck hijacking, he only died Inside, like a year or two ago. Yeah, it wasn't that long ago. Inside, he volunteered to participate in what he was told was a drug experiment aimed at finding a cure here. for schizophrenia. Whitey, along with 19 other inmates, were given LSD nearly every day. For 15 months. Oh my no. God. Without being told what it was. In a rare report on an MK Ultra experiment from the subject's perspective, he describes his experience as following. In 1957, while a prisoner at the Atlanta Penitentiary, I, rec- I was recruited by Dr. Carl Pfeiffer of Emory University to join a medical project that was researching the cure for schizophrenia. For our participation, we would receive three days of good time for each month on the project. We were injected with massive doses of LSD-25. In minutes, the drug would take over, and about eight or nine men, Dr. Pfeiffer and several men in suits who were not doctors, would give us tests to see how we reacted. Eight 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 convicts in a panic and paranoid state. Total loss of appetite. Hallucinating. The room would change shape. Hours of paranoia and feeling violent. We experienced horrible periods of living nightmares and even blood coming out of the walls. Guys turning into skeletons in front of me. I saw a camera turn into the head of a dog. I felt like I was going insane. The men in suits would be in a room and hook me up to machines asking questions like, did you kill anyone? Who uh, would you kill anyone? Two men went psychotic. They all had symptoms of schizophrenia. They had to be pried loose from under the beds, growling and barking and frothing at the mouth. What the fuck? They put them in a strip cell down the hall. I never saw or heard of them again. Oh my God. They told us we were helping find a cure for schizophrenia. When it was all over, everyone would feel suicidal and depressed, wrung out emotionally. Time would stand still. I tried to quit, but Dr. Pfeiffer would appeal to me. Please, you're my best subject, and we are so close to finding a cure, was his line. Dude, what so the Whitey fuck? Bulger, before he became the monster that he would become, was experiments to fif- uh, rather put to fifteen months of everyday daily LSD experience, uh, experiments. I I don't know how you could even like 
same. try him fairly anymore. Bulger was a victim of MK Ultra. It's nuts. Is that in the movie? Uh, I don't know. I didn't see the movie. I didn't so see I it know. either. What the fuck? <laughs> Jesse, how are you? How are you, are you already just, I, I just, a lot of head shaking. I, he wrote it himself, LSD. right? I don't know how, like, I don't know how brain functions after that. I don't know. Yet, but good question. Well, we could try it. <laughs> yeah, we could just try it I out. Got, I got stuff to do. 15 yeah, me months. Too. I got stuff to do. I mean, I'll take yeah, about a 15 month LSD, break. LSD, baby. If, Let's do if it. If you give me a 15 month break, I promise I'll go right back. I'll go right back to what I was doing a year ago. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just let me pause everything. Fifteen months. Let me just like take an LSD time. Mm -hmm. I'll walk out. You'll come out of change. Next man. day, I'll be fully dressed, ready to go, ready to go back into the world. Well, Pfeiffer became prominent for his research into schizophrenia, but in 1971, he destroyed records of the LSD experiments he had conducted on prisoners in the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. This did not save him from the 1975 Rockefeller report releasing the information that his experiments in the 50s were not designed for curing schizophrenia, but for the CIA. And James Whitey Bulger caught wind of this and was enraged to learn that the project that had destroyed his life was not in the effort of helping him, but in the interest of the CIA. He told a subordinate he was going to find Pfeiffer and kill him. Bulger was not given the chance as the FBI captured him for other crimes. Before he could. Good Lord. One last person we're going to cover is a man by the name of Harold Abramson. Harold Abramson, uh, an LSD pioneer, entered the MK Ultra. Uh, How do you say that Ouvre? word? O E U V R E? Ouvre. It's a French word. Ouvre. It's like Ouvre. Ouvre. When he began shepherding Gottlieb's forays into self experimentation with LSD. What's his name? Abramson? Harold Abramson. In mid-1953, Gottlieb gifted Abramson $85,000, or in today's money, $830,000 of MK Ultra money for the, con for the conduction of experiments with LSD and hallucinogenics along the following lines. Disturbance of memory, discrediting by aberrant behavior, alteration of sex patterns, eliciting of information, suggestibility, and creations of dependence. All things we've already heard a few times over. Good you Lord. just see that they're just kind of just having a bunch of people do it all in different areas of the world. Disturbingly, Abramson was fascinated with the effects of mind-altering drugs on children. He closely monitored experiments, including one in which 12 pre-puberty boys were, fell, were fed psilocybin, the psilocybin like magic shrooms. mushrooms. Yep, and another in which 14 children by the ages of 6 and 11 were diagnosed with schizophrenia that were given 100 micrograms of LSD each for six weeks straight. What the fuck? During the 1960s and 70s, Abramson, the first American to experiment with LSD, organized several international conferences on LSD. And in 1967, he published a book called The Use of LSD in Psychotherapy and Alcoholism. He also worked in studies for which he was actually trained, as he never studied psychiatry or pharmacology and co-founded the Journal of Asthma. He died in 1980. So we were just the, the U.S. government was directly funding child experiments in the U.S. Just straight up. Now, of course, MK Ultra had a bunch of sub projects. We're going to go through a little bit of it, but we're kind of at the end here of MK Ultra. And so I'm pleased to inform you, boys, today is going to be the final episode of MK Good Ultra. Lord. We're going to wrap this sucker up in the next 15 to 20 minutes here. We're just going to talk a little bit here about the sub projects, and then we're going to talk about the final bit, which is how it all came out. Gottlieb was a meticulous individual, and he organized each of the studies performed by MK Ultra into sub projects. Thanks to the later legal battles and inquiries, we actually have a list of them. There are 149 MK Ultra subprojects, many of which appear to have some connection with research into behavioral modification, unsurprisingly, and as well as drug acquisition and testing or administering drugs serendipitously. Uh, serendipitously. Thank you. Yeah, I just got a lot of words happening today, and I'm I'm losing it, dude. It's been a long one. They belong to 15 different categories. Research into the effects of behavioral drugs and alcohol, 
17 subprojects, probably not involving human testing, but we can't be sure. 14 subprojects, definitely not involving tests on human volunteers. 19 subprojects, probably including tests on human volunteers. But while not known, some of these subprojects may have included tests on unwitting subjects as well. Six subprojects involving tests on unwitting subjects. Also, research in hypnosis included eight subprojects, including, sub, uh, including two involving hypnosis and drug combinations, acquisition of chemical drugs, and seven projects involved in, in the acquisition of them. Basically, the way this all breaks down is that every single aspect of MKUltra had a subproject attached to it. There was not a single point in MKUltra that was not being watched over by Gottlieb entirely. He was just, he built all this stuff. He had polygraph research happening as well, studies of human behavior, sleep research and behavioral changes during psychotherapy, library searches and attendance at seminars and international conferences on behavioral modification, and so on. So it's not all just drug stuff. He was doing just other normal sleep studies as well, but it was all under the MK Ultra umbrella. Uh, umbrella. I'm sure there's just and, no, I'm sure there's just no boundary. It's just like, by pure chance, sometimes it's not human torture, but like, I don't think he yep. was like, I'm just going to do some normal ones and some dark ones. Yep. The last bits, the last ones we'll talk about here, the one that are kind of uh, important. There was sub projects involving funding support for unspecified activities connected with the army's special operations division at Fort Detrick. Um, the medical uh, under CIA project, Naomi, uh, the army assisting CIA in developing testing and maintaining biological agents and delivery systems for, for use against humans as well as against animals and crops. There was single sub-projects in such areas as effects of electroshock, harassment techniques for offensive use, analysis of extrasensory perception, gas-propelled sprays and aerosols, and four sub-projects involving crop and material sabotage. One or two sub-projects on each of the following, blood grouping, research controlling the activities of animals, energy storage, and transfer in organic systems, and stimulus in response, uh, and stimulus in response in biological systems. And finally, three subprojects canceled before any work was done on them, having to do with laboratory drug screening, research on brain concussion, and research on biologically active materials to be tested through the skin on human volunteers. I am officially desensitized to the horrors of this <laughs> violence. Yeah, man. Uh, that's I just that's a few of them. There's like a bunch that we're not going to touch. Um, now we're just going to talk about how it all came out. The discovery happened in 1970 under the Nixon administration. Nixon feared the outbreak of a global pandemic and ordered all government agencies to destroy their stores of bioweapons and chemical toxins. Army scientists complied, but unsurprisingly, Gottlieb hesitated. He asked the chief of his chemical divisions, Nathan Gordon, for an inventory of CIA stocks. Gordon reported that the medicine chest at Fort Detrick contained 10 biological agents that could cause diseases, including smallpox, tuberculosis, equine encephalitis, and anthrax, as well as six organic toxins, including snake venom and paralytic shellfish poison. Gordon and Gottlieb were both disturbed at the prospect of losing all their work, so Gordon suggested that they secretly move all of their poisons from Fort Detrick. Gordon went so far as to find a research center in Maryland that would be willing to house the materials for $75,000 a year. Gordon and Gottlieb met with Helms and Tom Carmenesis, the CIA's uh, deputy for plans, a few days later, and it was agreed that the agency had no realistic option other than to follow the president's orders and destroy the stock, but not for a lack of trying. Everything began to trouble. Uh, everything began to crumble, however, on June 17th, 1972, with, of course, nothing other than the Watergate incident. What? A security guard at the White House, uh, the, sorry, a security guard at the Watergate complex in Washington noticed a piece of tape over a door lock at the office of the Democratic National Committee. He called the police and several intruders were arrested. Why did he do the that? The intruders turned out to have connections to the White House and the CIA. Gottlieb Technical Services Division had prepared false identity papers for two of them, Howard oh Hunt my God. and G. Gordon Liddy, yep. and had provided Hunt with implements of espionage, including a speech alteration device, a camera concealed in a tobacco pouch, and a wig and glasses disguise. Nixon sought wig help from the CIA. Wig and disguise? To... Yeah, it's like a ground Yeah, that's mark. exactly like... what I'm picturing. <laughs> Nixon sought help from the CIA to contain the fallout from the Watergate break-in. Helms refused to create a cover story that would ex uh, exculpate the White House. 
In, in response, on February 1st, 1973, Nixon fired him. With that, Gottlieb's longtime protector was now gone. As Helms was packing to leave, he summoned Gottlieb for a farewell. The talk turned to MK Ultra, and they knew that no one could find out what they had done. In one of the last acts as, uh, as director of the CIA, Helms ordered the destruction of all MK Ultra records. And on January 30th, 1973, seven boxes of documents were shredded. God damn it. Around the same time, Gottlieb told his secretary to open his sa office safe, remove files marked MK Ultra or secret sensitive, and destroy them. She did exactly as she was told. Helms replacement James uh, Schles Schlesinger arrived and was determined to make changes. Gottlieb became his first target. Gottlieb's biggest project was MK Ultra, and it was no longer well regarded. He was Helms' protege, and the Helms era was now officially over. His reputation was tainted by his involvement with the Watergate burglars. So, Schlesinger it changed the name of the Technical Services Division to the Office of Technical Services. And Gottlieb remained chief, but it was clear the end was near. And in, and in April, Schlesinger called John McMahon and told McMahon to come and run OTS. And on May 9th, 1973, he sent out a cable to case officers all over the world. It said the following, I am determined that the law shall be respected. I am taking several actions to complement this objective. I have ordered all the senior operating officials of this agency to report to me immediately on any activity going on or that may have gone on in the past, which might be considered to be outside the legislative charter of this agency. I hereby direct every person presently employed by the CIA to report to me on any such activities of which he has knowledge. I invite all ex-employees to do the same. Anyone who has such information should, uh, should call my secretary and say that he wishes to talk to me about activities outside the CIA's charter. Two days later, Nixon announced he was moving Schlesinger to a new job as Secretary of Defense and replaced him with career officer Will William Colby. Soon after he took office, Colby was given a thick, loose-leaf book that would forever change the CIA. Colby that died sick. in a weird way, too, though. Yeah. The 693-page closed typed document were the responses to Schlesinger's cable to report illegal activities within the CIA. While there were many references to what MKUltra was doing, Gottlieb's name only appeared one time in the 693-page document. It said the How following. How is that possible? Because <laughs> Gottlieb was good at what he did. In January 1973, Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, advising that he was acting on instructions from DCI Richard Helms, ordered the destruction of all records associated with drug research and testing. On the 31st January 1973, Seven boxes of progressive reports from 1953 to 1967 were recalled from the archives and destroyed. In addition, 25 copies of a booklet entitled LSD-25, Some Unpsychedelic Implications, were destroyed. This document came to be known as the CIA Family Jewels, and it was agreed that it should remain a secret. For the next year, the Watergate scandal absorbed the American consciousness and led to Nixon's resignation on August 9, 1974, in his replacement with Gerald Ford. And we don't know what the Seven family jewels late. is. Well, we do, we do that, that report with all the information. Oh, with that the family is jewels. the family jewels. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That is the family jewels. That's what they just named it. That several months later, Colby was contacted by in investigative reporter, Seymour Hirsch, who had stumbled onto one of the family jewels, a project known as MH chaos. <laughs> MH was the prefix used for projects with worldwide reach. MK was specifically sounds less. like a Square Enix game. <laughs> MH Chaos was the project under which the CIA had compiled dossiers on thousands of American journalists and anti-war activists. So scary. Horrifying. So, worldwide. Worldwide. That is. Colby did not deny the story, though the story that eventually made it to the New York Times made a no mention of the drug experiments of MK Ultra. It led to the series of investigations that blew open MKUltra. The revelation of MK, MH Chaos led to Congress to propose establishing a special committee to investigate illegal acts by the CIA. <laughs> the first outside force since Mike Manfield's attempt in 1950 to threaten the agency's secrecy. 
Ford opposed, as what uh, as was senior CIA officers. But this political climate had changed, and Americans were clamoring for transparency with the government. Ford decided to preempt Congress by announcing the formation of his own CIA commission. He wanted a bland report that would find some mischief, but nothing grand. He hoped this would uh, this he hoped that this would pacify co- Congress, but more importantly. Calm the public. How does he That's not a see, one-term president how thinking does right he there. Not yep. see the implications of that, uh, dude. It's, uh, that, that question has been asked every episode of this series and every day of my life so far. <laughs> yeah. To ensure a forgiving report, Ford appointed his vice president Nelson Rockefeller as chairman. Hours after the announcement, Ford contacted Helms and said that he was going to give the commission a very narrow mandate and warn its members that it would uh, that it would be. Tr- uh, that it would tragic be tragic to exceed it. Quote, it would be a shame if the public uproar forces to go beyond and to damage the integrity of the CIA. I <laughs> automatically assume what you did was right unless proven otherwise. Sounds like End a quote. recent phone call I heard today. Yeah, isn't it? Isn't <laughs> That's it crazy. Oddly prescient of the times yeah. that we are currently in. a perfect in. phone call. Very bizarre. Perfect. It would yeah. be tragic if you'd been It'd be so beyond. tragic, yeah. It might be a crime. I don't know. <laughs> Some people say Ford it is. Some people say it is. President, isn't. right, Jesse? Yeah. Wow. This is so crazy. It's it's <laughs> funny to me that people speak the exact same way and never like. I'm not saying you're gonna get in trouble, but it would be an awful shame. Well, I mean, it's, it's literally the example of like you have to be taught history or be doomed to repeat. Yeah, it. it's, it's like, basically an American sedition by now. I mean, tradition by now. <laughs> hey oh, oh, that's good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the Rockefeller Commission, officially known as the President's Commission on CIA Activities within the United States, appropriately boringly named so people wouldn't pay attention to it, was issued on June 11th, 1975, and was a mild uh, as circumstances would allow. It concluded that the CIA had carried out plainful, uh, plainly unlawful operations. <laughs> but it, these are the examples they gave. Spying on protest groups, tapping phones, committing burglaries, and opening mail. Stories that assassination <laughs> plots against foreign leaders had begun to circulate in Washington, but the commission report said that the, that time did not permit for a full investigation. Oh my God. That is, <laughs> that's that like is what the they said Washington. when they said they needed to, they couldn't put ladies in Assassin's Creed or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It does run the does same. Time does not permit such an impossible endeavor. <laughs> that's really the same though. It really is. Ridiculous. Um, it is. It's nuts. Uh, the report did not mention NK Ultra by name, but it did say that the CIA had run a project to test potentially dangerous drugs on unsuspecting United States and citizens. And it rhymed with Bembe Ultra. <laughs> oh, God. I just Another can't believe that that's, that you, you can say that and people don't immediately react like, what? Yeah. It's really a lot of it. I wonder how much of it is the the purposeful bland language that they use. You know what oh, I mean? Like that is to, to 100% it. As much as, yeah, that is 100% they put it, away where they, it. They use words that like, you know, people won't, don't see very often. It's just like too much. And it, let's, I, be, I, yeah. let's be clear. We are still in the country where six hours before a vote's supposed to be scheduled, they drop like a 500 page bill and they're like, read up. Oh, you didn't have time. Yep. Okay, we're voting. Like yep. that's we that's how we roll. We just faith, are like. Bro. Yeah, the worst. bad faith. It is awful. Um, another that involves this is a, the the this they they did mention it by saying uh, there was a project potentially t- to test potentially dangerous drugs on unsuspecting United States citizens. Another that involved giving drugs to prison inmates, and a third in which unsuspecting volunteers were given LSD at two secret sites. One paragraph dealt with the Frank Olson incident, though not by name directly. One paragraph. Yeah, one. And we didn't, over the we didn't even say the man. guy's name. Like, but yeah, dude yep. flew out of a window. It's, it's, ugh, God. The Rockefeller's committee mild report did not satisfy critics. Really? So the Senate formed, yeah, no shit. So the Senate formed the select committee to study governmental operations with respect to intelligence age activities. That was the name, the full name of the committee. This was headed by Frank Church and it became known as the Church Commission. <laughs> <laughs> the Church Commission's investigators found several documents mentioning plots to assassinate foreign leaders. Most of the names of the CIA agents were redacted, but one remained available. Sidney Gottlieb. Finally, that motherfucker. Church, right? The Church Committee investigators asked the CIA for permission to interview Gottlieb, but were told that he had retired and left the States. 
The investigators insisted the C- uh, and the CIA's legal office relented and found Gottlieb. After Gottlieb was removed from his government position, he and his wife spent time traveling the world after abandoning all their material belongings. Sounds awful. They literally, after he was done doing the spy thing, they dropped all their material belongings and started traveling the world. He just achieved enlightenment and like vanished into happiness for the yeah, rest of his like days. He's got nothing else to do in his life. He literally got to do everything he ever wanted by torturing people and, and now he's doing poisoning that this. elephant. Hilariously, they actually ended up volunteering in a hospital in Uttar Pradesh, India, where Margaret Gottlieb became very ill. While she was convalescing in a hospital, Sydney was called back to the U.S. to deal with building scandals. Gottlieb retained Terry Lenznar uh, on the advice of some former colleagues. That's uh, the lawyer. Uh, Lenznar cautioned that they should ask for immunity for, from prosecution before proceeding with the committee's questions, and Lenznar outlined their legal challenges. The church committee was investigating assassination plots in which Gottlieb had been involved. In New York, the district attorney was looking into Frank Olson's death and Gottlieb no longer wielded power at the CIA and had few remaining friends there. So Gottlieb was kind of just in a bad spot. He agreed to testify to the committee, but not without immunity. Thus began a series of public hearings probing into all manner of unlawful or improper conduct by the CIA. At the first hearing, Colby revealed the existence of MK Naomi, the partnership between the CIA and the Army Special Operations Division at Fort Detrick. Colby produced a summary of its work written in 1967 when Gottlieb was running the Technical Service Division. It said that MK MK Naomi had two purposes, to stockpile severely incapacitating lethal materials for for specific use within the, uh, for specific use of TSD, and to maintain an operational readiness, special and unique items for the dissemination of chemical and biological materials. Not wanting to fight Lenzner on the subject, the committee gave Gottlieb immunity. And on October 7th, 1975, Gottlieb began his testimony and it came to roughly 40 hours in total. And thus it became finally public knowledge, at least starting to. Just the idea, these projects yeah, the concept were, that existed. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Gottlieb gave his testimony under the assumed name Joseph Scheider. To protect his identity. Why? Fuck his identity. As Senate Senate rules require, the church committee sealed the testimony for 50 years, which means it could be declassified in five. However, committee reports quoted passages. Uh, Joseph Scheider, Gottlieb, testified that he had two or three conversations with Richard Bissell in 1960 about the agency's capacity to assassinate foreign leaders, one report says. Scheider informed Bissell that the CIA had access to lethal or potentially lethal biological materials that could be used in this manner. After the meeting, Scheider, Gottlieb, uh, Scheider, also, I'm just going to say Gottlieb from now on, Gottlieb reviewed a list of the biological materials available at the Army's Chemical Corps installation at Fort Detrick, Maryland, which would produce diseases that would either kill the individual or incapacitate him so severely that he would be out of action. Gottlieb selected one material from the list, which was supposed to produce a disease that was indigenous to that area and that could be fatal. The Congo station officer testified that he received rubber gloves, a mask, and a syringe, along with lethal biological materials from Gottlieb, who also instructed him on their use. Often during the hearing, when faced with questions he'd rather not answer, Gottlieb pleaded bad memory to avoiding answering. Does this sound familiar, by the way, (laughs) to a recent... Public yeah. hearings in the past couple years? I don't years? know what you're talking about. Exactly. I don't recall. One writer observed that Gottlieb, quote, claimed to have forgotten virtually everything he had spent the last 25 years Here's researching. Here's the thing. I kind of believe him based on how many fucking drugs he was doing. <laughs> that, I mean, fair yeah. enough. Mm, but unfortunately, Gottlieb escaped the hearing without too much damage, and the New York police investigation on Olson's death proved inconclusive. Their cover-up job was excellent. Then the Department of Justice became involved. Due to the Washington Post article reporting on Gottlieb's destruction of the MK Ultra records, the DOJ began to investigate as it was classified under destruction of government property. Unfortunately, as Gottlieb was in the Senate testimony and had already secured immunity, nothing could be done. The FBI attempted to secure Gottlieb for testimony once he had finished the, his Senate testimony, to which Lesnar was originally amenable but he rescinded the offer at the conclusion of the Senate testimony. Over a 15-month period, the church committee held 126 public hearings. These are the ones that people are very familiar with. Interviewed 800 witnesses 
and reviewed more than 100,000 documents. It focused on the more egregious of the accusation, such as domestic spying and international assassination plots. In its final report, the Church Committee concluded, intelligence agencies have undermined the constitutional rights of citizens. There is no inherent constitutional authority for the president or any intelligence agency to violate the law. The report also included a summary of what it had discovered of the CIA's mind control programs, including the earliest of the CIA's major programs involving the use of chemical and biological agents, Project Bluebird, investigating the possibilities of control of an individual by application of special interrogation techniques. In August 1951, the project was renamed Artichoke, as we know. MKUltra was the principal CIA program involving said research. And because MKUltra records were destroyed, it is impossible to reconstruct the operational use of MKUltra materials by the CIA overseas. Overall, as we wrap up, gentlemen, and while I kind of just end this all by saying we know kind of all the public things and Gottlieb literally got away with it all, we will never, ever know what information the CIA took from MKUltra and still uses to this day. All of that research was properly destroyed, and it wasn't until another 15 years after it shut down that it became known within our government and then known publicly. And that is where I'm just going to put a pin on MK Ultra and call this series fucking complete. That's why you should pay <laughs> attention to what the government is doing, guys. That's why you should pay attention. If you want to get into... Uh, like the, 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 the whole hearing, like the hearing itself is a huge amount of information. There's a, you can watch a lot of those public hearings and to hear some of the very personal experiences of some of these victims is heart wrenching. So if you do plan on going to listen to it, just be, it's kind of hard. It's a little harsh. It's, it's really, really just harsh. Just listen to people on drugs in the fifties instead. It's much more entertaining. And I do want to put out as well. Um, just kind of like, you know, thoughts to those. There were so many. Uh, you know, you'd call them lesser dead, more or less, but unnamed victims of Pfeiffer and all these other doctors that died. Just like I thought to those people who, the countless people who died under these programs under our watch, like that, that's a horrendous mass murdering tragedy. And it's just important when listening to this, and I know we, we laugh a lot and we make a lot of jokes, but people died. And it's important that this shit is known. Um, I hope it was entertaining for everybody as well, obviously. Um, I'm glad to be done with MK Ultra. It was a hell of a project. Thank you to the pa- members of Patreon uh, because this project would have still been in the works if we weren't able to pay and 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 bring on Deanna to help. This she gave epic like, stuff. To give you an idea, my each of my scripts, I, I have a total now of about seventy pages of uh, sixty pages of script of scripting. And Deanna's outline, her own outline was over 80 pages for this thing. Beast. Like, this was an enormous undertaking. It took uh, about two to three months of us reading and putting this together. So thank you. It's not a woe was me. It was so much work. We loved it. It was so great. I'm so glad I got to have a partner by my side to help me with it because uh, you guys allow us to do this. So thank you. Hell yeah. Jesse and Alex, how are you feeling after this journey? It's a mixed I mean, bag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look. Pay attention to what they do, not what they say. Yeah, that's exactly. how you work with government. Do your research. I hope that pay attention. I hope that people that this kind of opened. I, there's a lot of people out there who's like, "Oh my god, I had no idea." That's what I hope the lesson you take away. They can say the platitudes all they want, but as we've made clear, they're gonna lie until they're caught. Yep. So yeah, that's it. I'm done. We're going off to record our mini, and then it's gonna go up on Patreon or right away. Thank you guys so much for the support. Yeah. Thank you for. The reviews, the five-star reviews, picking up merch, Patreon support, or just binging the podcast. We love you all. We'll be back next week with something entirely different, much lighter, and in the vein of an Alex episode, I think. I'm going to talk about the Oumuamua uh, on the mini So if you want to come sign up for that, go check it out. Or if you're already signed up, just go get ready to listen to it. We'll be there. Thank you, guys. We'll see you over there. And uh, for all of you uh, who are just here for the main episodes, we will see you next Hell yeah. Thank you for listening. Goodbye, everybody. Anyway, me and my wife were sitting outside indulging on our porch one night, enjoying ourselves. I needed to go to the bathroom, so I stepped back inside. And after a few moments, I hear my wife go, holy shit, get out here. So I quickly dash back outside. She's looking up at the sky in awe. I look up too, and there's a perfect line of dozen lights traveling across the sky.